This is KPPQ LP Ventura, 104.1 FM, and we're in the women's room, where we appreciate and support each other. I'm your host, Kathleen Good. My guest today is Marie Lakin, a local environmental champion in Ventura. Because Ventura County is heating up faster than any other place in the country, I invited Marie on the show to continue our coverage of women who are working to mitigate the effects of climate change. Marie is also a candidate for Ventura City Council District 5. We're so happy to have you here today, Marie. Well, thank you for inviting me, Kathleen. And I do believe that strong women's voices are needed right now. And your show is such a showcase for that. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, let's uh, just hop right in. Now, your experience in environmental justice and climate change runs deep. In fact, you've been termed a climate champion. Now, you worked for Senator Fran Pavley, who is known as the mother of California's climate policies and has authored uh, legislation on global warming solutions. So could you tell us about your hero, Fran Pavley, and, well, and then also tell us what was your job when you were working with her? Sure. Well, I mean, I always tell everybody if I don't do anything else with the rest of my life, I will die happy because I was able to work for one of my heroes and oh. Fran really was my hero. And the fact that she hired me, I know when I got the job, I went out in my front yard and just went, Whoa. <laughs> because yes, um, she honestly has done more to further the goals of the climate movement than anyone I know. And anyone I can think of, honestly, uh, she started out small with the uh, standards that would help us reduce uh, emissions from cars here in the state. And then she moved on to legislation like the Global Warming Solutions Act and the fracking bill, which is something that I worked on myself. And I actually got um, the actual bill in my office and it's uh, signed and framed. And, and so it's something someday my kids can bring to the antiques roadshow or something. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I love that I got that and I worked really hard. That took a big part of my life. But you know, what, what did Fran do? So these standards that reduced emissions in automobiles uh, were then used as the basis for Obama's own uh, climate uh, Oh. policy and, and and so he invited her to a rose gardens uh ceremony and it was it was like her cinderella moment i know and he just he didn't know who she was at first and she was sitting in the front row and someone introduced her and really that was uh, obama's signature piece and that was based on the legislation that we did here in california and i think when we were came out so strong with climate uh policy then other states and countries followed along. I know that, uh, I mean, I had so many amazing moments, but I think the one that really sticks with me is um, because I did um, technical work for uh, Senator Pavley, communications work. I was her deputy district rec director. I helped get support for a lot of these bills is I set up a call between her and the Chinese. Oh. And, um, what they wanted to know, uh, from Fran was the political um, realities of trying to uh, implement a cap and trade program. And so her uh, Global Warming Solutions Act was kind of the basis, the framework for what eventually became cap and trade in this state. And the Chinese were very interested in uh, sending along their own program. So we, it was, it was really interesting. She was on one end in a, uh, you know, a computer. And then the Chinese delegation was in China on their computer. And we were doing this through, um, well, what, like what we're doing now, Zoom back then. And I was, there were these amazing translators translating what we were saying uh, back and forth. And I remember at the time thinking, you know, I'm watching a little bit of history. Um, and so 
she did so much for climate and, and so much, much of it spread to other states and like I said, other countries. And so when she finally um, turned out, and of course we were all very sad about that, um, MSNBC sent a, a reporter up to do a big piece on her and I escorted that gentleman around for two whole days. And it, you know, I was really glad to see people recognize her work because she was, she started out as a, a middle school teacher. And then she took on this amazing climate uh, legislation, groundbreaking, really. And, and she got it done. I'm so proud to have been a part of that staff. So. Wow. So is there anything from this exciting experience? I'm sure there's a lot uh, that any kind of practical knowledge you learned uh, that you can use now when working uh, in climate change. Well, just in life, really. I mean, I think the thing that was amazing about Fran is she worked with both sides of the aisle really, really well. And she uh, tried to um, make sure that, you know, she had support for all her legislation from uh, Republicans, Democrats, from everyone. And she would compromise. And I think sometimes people think compromise is a dirty word. And it really isn't because we got things done by giving a little that probably if she hadn't done that would not have moved at all. So then with legislation like that, you can always go back and add more, but just getting it passed the first time. And I think she taught me that you really need to listen to all sides and really spend a lot of time, not just working with the other legislators and other people um, like any, uh, any board you're on really, but also spending time talking to the public and taking a lot of comment. And I mean, that was part of my job and then I was um, taking public comment all the time on all her bills and going out and talking about her bills to everyone. And then of course would write about her legislation because I was doing her newsletter and other work. So yeah, that, that I think it is important not to always stay in your silo to Sometimes spend time with people who don't exactly think like you. I right. think you can widen your perspective that way. And I think that's what we are sorely needed right now. We need to look at all sides of the story. So um, I was really amazed at how much firsthand experience you have in working with disasters. Um, would you tell your listener how you were involved in the methane gas calamity at Porter Ranch in Aliso Canyon? And what was your involvement in that? Right. I think um, oil companies would tell you that they um, practice a lot of safeguards and they do um, a lot of safety checks for everything they do. And, you know, that's probably true, but when things go wrong, they go spectacularly wrong. And the Lizzo Canyon gas leak was, was, honestly, it was atrocious. And, you know, 100,000 tons of methane rained down on this community of Porter Ranch. And um, along with the mercaptans that were, uh, mercaptans are an odorant that are, is put into gas to make it smell. It gives it that rotten egg smell. Oh, yeah. So that that is when you um, end up, you know, let's say you turned on your gas in, in your in, on your stove and you you smell that smell. Right. Right. And, and or something's not right. And so that's to let you know that there's a gas leak uh, there. And so that's what was all over this community. Now, methane tends to rise in the air, but the mercaptans went down into the communities, into the homes. And that that. Oh, boy. <laughs> the whole community you couldn't walk around but it, you smelled that and so of course the, all these people had to leave their homes during the holidays and be re relocated I mean if you could get your nails done anywhere you wouldn't have wanted to do it in Porter Ranch at that time you'd gone somewhere else so the businesses were all affected and it just took forever to fix it. <laughs> and what's frustrating at the time is that Governor Brown was really ignoring it uh, for whatever reason. He hadn't come down and visited those folks. So bright and early one morning, probably about 7.30 a.m., I got a call from the president of the uh, Porter Ranch Neighborhood Council. And she said, Marie, the governor's here. Can we get him to come here and look at um, Elisa Canyon and come and talk to us. And I thought, well, wow, you know, it's the governor. I don't know what I can do exactly. Um, so I called my chief of staff and I said, can we get 
Governor Brown to go talk to these folks. Um, he's in town. Uh, and so she had the number of uh, Wade Crowfoot, um, and he's like, he's currently um, California's um, Natural Resources Secretary, but she was, uh, he was in the car with Governor Brown, and somehow she managed to talk him into coming in to talk to the folks. So I guess they turned the car around on the freeway, and she told me that he ended up in uh, this woman's uh, uh, dining room that evening and talking to her. And then I guess he went off roading all over the um, <laughs> Aliso Canyon facility in that big black car of his. And yeah, he came. And so honestly, that that to me was you, you say one person can't do much, but here here's this this woman who's feeling desperate called me at 7 30 a.m. and we got the governor to come out. So, uh, and, and later, really soon after that, he declared a disaster emergency for that area. And it was, it really was. And to this day, it still operates. And of course, they say we need it to um, make sure the lights come on and we need that facility. I believe with all, you know, in the future with all the solar panels and battery storage that we're putting up that um, these sorts of facilities will have a diminishing use, at least I hope so. Uh, let's uh, just move on uh, to talk a little bit about leadership. Um, what do you think is the most important quality a leader should have? Well, I think what I referred to earlier, uh, that you really need to spend some time talking to everyone. Never go into anything with your mind made up. The listening is the most important thing to do. And, you know, stay away from special interests. Um, keep your mind clear and make sure that you're kind and that you explain yourself well. I think those are all good qualities in a leader. Okay, they sound terrific. Now, uh, other important work you do and have done is with the East Side Community Council. Uh, you describe this as a labor of love. What has been and still is your role in this nonprofit? I, for the past four years, I've been chair and vice chair of this organization. And yes, it's a labor of love because I like um, activating my community and uh, making sure that their voices are listened to. I can't even begin to describe how much fun it is to interact with these folks. And sometimes the meetings get a little heated and, um, you know, tough questions are asked of uh, council members and other officials that, you know, are in charge of things that affect these folks' lives. And, but, you know, I've never had anybody turn me down uh, to come in to talk to us. And, we, you know, for a while we were obviously in person until COVID hit. And then we uh, switched to Zoom, which has actually increased attendance. And so, mm -hmm. Recently, since I'm a running for council, our bylaws say that I had to step off the board. So I did, um, but I'm still, because of our bylaws, uh, allowed to help them with things. And I, I do pitch in as, as much as I can, as uh, well I do with my other volunteer uh, activities. I want to make sure that I'm not leaving anybody in the lurch because I'm doing something else right now. But uh, I really enjoy that part of my life. Uh, that is, I get to work directly with my neighbors, listen to them and hear their concerns. And I, I that it's community building. That's what I like about it. Oh, so um, what is its uh, exact mission that, of this nonprofit? Yeah, we're just we're just a little community group. We're not affiliated with the city, so um, you know we, we're recognized as a council, community council, like the other ones. But none of us have any direction uh, or any umbrella oversight um, with the city. We just operate independently. And so really it is just to um, commit to great community dialogue on behalf of our folks that live out here and uh, make sure that they're aware of the issues that affect their lives. And that's pretty much our mission. Okay, well, you mentioned that it was like talking to your neighbors. Uh, so uh, how does this forum inform you about what's going on on the East Side? I guess that's kind of obvious, but uh, what I'm thinking here is uh, what types of questions do residents ask frequently? 
<laughs> when is my street in front of my house going to be paved? <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I hear that a lot. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I got to say some of our East End streets are pretty awful. I've got weeds growing out of the middle of mine. Um, and so I, I, you know, I've talked to the city and they tell us, well, you know, uh, the streets in front of our houses aren't their priority and it's the main thoroughfare. And, but, you know, I don't, I'm not really sure what criteria they use to, uh, determine wh which street gets paved first. I guess it's on a, um, a yearly, um, you know, they look at how many years since it's been done. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's a mystery to me exactly how um, some inlands in, in interior streets get prioritized and others don't. Okay. That would have to explain that one. Other things um, they're concerned about water rates and water, they're running out of water. Uh, out here and everywhere actually and their lawns are brown and they're worried that uh, further water rationing is going to happen to them they're worried about you know what is going on the city council what is happening uh, with leadership there there's a lot of different concerns I've heard okay and I'm going to have to break in right here because we have to take a station break this is KPPQ LP Ventura, 104.1 FM, and we're in the women's room where we appreciate and support each other. I'm your host, Kathleen Good. My guest today is Marie Lakin, a local environmental champion in Ventura. Because Ventura County is heating up faster than any other place in the country, I invited Marie on the show to continue our coverage of women who are working to mitigate the climate crisis. Uh, stay tuned to hear more about Marie Lakin's extensive service over the years in Ventura, as well as more about her work for our environment. And we're back. And I'd like to continue this discussion about the Eastside Community Council and give our listeners some information. Uh, so who can join the discussion? Um, they're, they just meet the third Thursday of every single month. And the link to the Zoom, we're still staying on Zoom right now because we, we pulled our folks and nobody wanted to switch. Um, but uh, to in person again, they just haven't wanted to. And I think part of that is the reason that we do have some folks who are seniors who um, are tend to not want to go out so much at night. And I think a lot of them are still being cautious. I mean, there's we're still getting vaccinations. We all need, still need to worry about COVID. Uh, so uh, we are still on Zoom. And um, you can just go to www.eastventura.com. Dot org and the link will always be there. So okay, so East Ventura Council or just East Ventura. East Ventura dot org. Org. Okay, yeah. Yeah. and anyone can attend. Uh, yes, who lives it you don't have to live in the east. Um, and you know we get people from all over the city on our zooms. And I mean to be a member, you have to be on the east end. But to attend a zoom, you can be from anywhere. Okay. And uh, say again when you meet, uh, just so our listener can third, get third that. Third day of every single month, except for December, or dark in December. So, but What time? Uh, we start at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Okay. So let's talk about housing. Now, um, is there any affordable housing in Ventura? Yeah. I mean, we've, we've got a number of organizations that have built truly affordable units um the housing the city's got its own housing authority and so they've built quite a bit um and then there's some that's been developer produced uh by uh, including a few affordables in the projects but one problem we have uh, is that when you build rentals in this town we there's nothing that says that you have to produce affordable rentals and um, what we need to look at and finish is an inclusionary housing policy that states that a certain percentage of the units should be affordable. And I think studies have shown that inclusionary housing policy is the best way to combat homelessness. And we certainly have a significant homelessness problem in this town. 
for many reasons, not just for that, but there's a lot of reasons behind that. Right. So uh, whoever is developing uh, these uh, apartments or condos has to make sure that some of them, a uh, percentage of them are affordable. So yeah, we've got it. It applies to for sale housing right now, but we don't have inclusionary policy that applies to rentals. So okay. That, yeah. So uh, that needs to happen. It's been sitting on the back burner. <laughs> What is an affordable rent in Ventura as determined by the HUD, the Housing and Urban uh, well, Development? A better way to look at it maybe is to be able to afford the average rent in Ventura, you need to make $38 an hour. I mean, if you look at the professions that that are very common that many of us hold, do they all pay $38 an hour? I mean, I mean I've got a list down here. It's just like child care workers make $14 an hour, waiters and waitresses, 17, security guards, 17, nursing assistants, uh, 17, retail folks, 17. I mean, so <laughs> affordable for who, right? Right. So what's happening, obviously, is a lot of people are doubling up in places um, and we're moving away, moving out of the city. Are they moving out of California? I would imagine so. I think uh -huh. coastal areas are really plagued by high rent, especially not as much in inland areas, but coastal areas like Ventura. I mean, people want to live here and builders want to build here because they know they can sell and rent their apartments because this is a highly desirable place to live so right, so right. it's a problem when you have you know this nice weather that we have and this really great vibe and that that so many people want to live here and so the market is great for housing here and in then that sort of pushes back the folks who don't make as much money and the tenants who are turned out of their existing apartments because existing landlords want to make re renovations or charge higher rents and that's happening too we had a significant group of people that uh, were turned out of their apartments over in the Ventura Avenue area because the landlord decided to make some pretty extensive renovations. And without a lot of notice, these folks were forced to find something else very quickly. Things so, like that happen a lot. Right. So, yeah, the, the solution uh, or part of a solution could be the inclusionary housing. We could, and, and, it, and there's a lot of other things we can do as well. I mean, uh, junior accessory dwelling units, which is like building off an area of an existing house, but they would still share some facilities that wouldn't be completely separate. We've got state grants um, available, uh, tax credits um, from the state and the feds to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, there, the, there's not enough grants or funds though um, available in the state. It's just to do everything we'd want. I mean, the, the competition for these funds is incredible it, within cities. Uh, you know, it really does fall on the owners of properties to do that kind of work aside from uh, public agencies like the housing authorities or groups, the nonprofit groups like many mansions that build these things. So it, it's it's a very big problem in California and it's not getting any better. Okay. Well, let's leave that and uh, talk a little bit about, because we're, we're running out of time, talk about Arts Ventura and why you are involved right. in this yeah. arts That's nonprofit. That's labor of love, right? Uh, so um, I've been chair um, and or just a member of the uh, city's arts and culture commission for 16 years. I'm the city's longest serving commissioner. And at a certain point during the recession, <laughs> Um, the city cut back a lot of its arts funding and it made me pretty sad. And we lost Art Walk and a lot of other things. And arts businesses and artists were a significant part of Ventura. We have a lot of people that moved here just to be a part of that, moved their businesses here just to be a part of that. Um, at the time we were called, you know, California's new art city. And so then the city of support really sort of waned for it. And 
So a group of us put um, Art Walk together um, privately for a number of years, right? It's, it's not been happening lately because of COVID. And I decided, along with a bunch of other folks, that we needed a nonprofit to support these private efforts. So we've got a website that was a stated goal of the city's cultural plan that we do on our own. Um, it's arts listing website. And, you know, that was something that the city was supposed to take on and never could. And, uh, you know, we do nonprofit fundraising for arts groups, artists, uh, public art, and also uh, other cultural organizations that fit within the boundaries of our bylaws. And it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And we recently sponsored a uh, exhibit at the Museum of Ventura County. And we're going to expand this mission soon and just, just sort of stepping in for a little bit of what the city can no longer do. We're just doing it privately. Right. So uh, why do you think uh, the arts can help a community thrive? Well, I mean, th their business is like anything else, right? And in addition to providing income for folks and artists obviously want to sell art, I, it brings joy to our citizens and I think when you look at surveys, why um, workers will move to a certain city, they uh, they come because there's a thriving arts community and there's things to do. And then the other thing is cultural tourism, because studies have shown that cultural tourism, um, like coming in for an art show or um, a play, actually... Uh, brings more revenue to a city than just plain old tourism. These people stay longer and they spend more money. So that is a really good strategy for Ventura. Very practical one. A lot of our folks have suffered due to the pandemic, I think. Um, you know, so significant setback for the arts community, nation, really worldwide. <laughs> You couldn't bring in audiences. There's a lot of things we couldn't do. I mean, True. we put on a, a, a virtual first Friday uh, because uh, first Friday is Ventura's arts event. It happens every single um, month on Friday. And so we did it virtually for a while. It's Arts Ventura and the Artist Association um, put that on. So Okay. I also wanted to mention that uh, you've been immersed in Ventura Civic Affairs on many levels, and you were even a docent for the Dudley House. Let's have a very short time here, but uh, why is the sense of community and engagement in the history of that community so important to support? Well, Ventura is unique, and it's, a, I mean, a really old city our whole area is it's been um it was you know obviously under the mission system so it's got a longer a history than other communities like thousand oaks or moore park right so um keeping in touch with our roots and preserving our cultural heritage is very important to me and, and for any community to do that I thank you so much marie lakin for coming in to tell us about your involvement and your thinking about our environment the east side council housing as well as the nonprofit arts ventura i just want to thank you kathleen the work you do here uh you know, highlighting women and their goals and their missions has been um, very important. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Well, thank you again. Thank you all for listening in. This is KPPQ LP Ventura, 104.1 FM. And we're in the women's room where we appreciate and support each other. I'm your host, Kathleen Good.